there's a lot of hype around the DNA, and I think partly because in its early days, there was all these concerns that, well, we were gonna work out um, whether I'd actually got, got the kids with the woman down the road and didn't, I mean, you know, you're gonna start charging me uh, maintenance. Um, it's gonna be disclosed to ensure that it's company or I'm predisposed to Alzheimer's, I can't get insurance. There was all of these concerns about what the DNA would get. It's a tiny little bit of the DNA molecule that's taken, and it's not taken for that sort of analysis. It's taken to say, you're different from you. And it's owned by ACPO, it's not owned by the government. At this point in time, whether that might change in the future. Um, but I think it's just as bad, if you don't like having your DNA, to have your fingerprints as well. There is a school report that said, well, if you've done anything wrong, what's your problem? Why shouldn't you? Why don't we put everybody on it? Let's have the whole of the country on both databases, then we sort it. Whatever happens, if we find DNA fingerprints, you know we've got them. And what's the argument against that? Simple test, why well, should I? Big brother. Most crime is either opportunistic, <coughs> so <coughs> the, um, the drug addict sees the open window and is straight in, looking for something to steal, to sell in the pub, to get the money for the next fix of drugs. Forensic considerations are not their priority. Um, because we've done a lot of work um, here at the university looking at um, individuals, offenders, um, if you are taking drugs, how you might react differently at the crime scene. Certainly found if you are under the influence of drugs when you're committing crime, like a burglary, you're more likely um, to leave forensics behind because you're just not thinking you're more likely to still be on the premises when the police turn up because you've got no idea what's going on around you. You're more likely to be seen entering the premises by a neighbour because you're just not tuned into what you're trying to do. Um, with violent crime, a lot of it is spur of the moment. Um, once you've thrown that punch um, uh, or you've spilled some blood, then you know, your DNA has been transferred. Very difficult to have um, a violent crime involved with physical contact and not get an exchange of DNA. If you're a professional criminal, like a bank robber, you will today be forensically aware and you will go in a, a white suit, almost, like the uh, scenes crime officers wear. You will know you don't leave your fingerprints and your DNA behind. But fortunately, the African criminal does that. I mean, it's easy, isn't it? Wear gloves, don't leave fingerprints. Uh, but the police still detect many more crimes with fingerprints than they do DNA, many more. So the research for some years has been based around looking at, well, based on the DNA profile or a bit of the DNA profile we have, can we tell anything about that individual that without the police? Well, already after some years, the DNA database have said to the police, this is the likely ethnicity of the donor of the DNA, um, and this is their likely sex. They're now looking towards maybe getting other features <coughs> hair colour, eye colour, and ultimately maybe facial features. And if you were to put this on CSI Miami tonight, I guess what you do, you put the DNA in one end, and out the other end would come a picture of what the person looks like. <laughs> <laughs> but that is like the, the aspiration where ultimately you might uh, want to see this going. So that's, uh, that's sort of like the future, and um, not necessarily science, but the government haven't missed a trick here with thinking, oh, all these databases full of, full of information about people. So the government has aspirations to make a unified national biometrics database. So rather than say, oh, let's have a theme from database, or let's have a DNA database, let's have one big database that has the criminals in it, to start with if we're talking about the police, and that one database has got your DNA, it's got your picture, it's got your fingerprints, and we could extend that to have your iris as well, we could have other features about you. Um, but then it's only a short step to say, well, I know, well, let's, let's share all that with the border agency. Uh, let's share that with the uh, social security people. So uh, let's start sticking your national insurance number in there. Let's put your NHS number in. Oh, I know. We could work with the NHS. We could shove all your medical history in there as well. Don't forget your driving license, of course. And all of a sudden, you have a big, big brother database that anything anybody ever wants to know about you, including what you buy at Tesco's, because they all know that already, is in this one database. The government would say, no, no, we just want it for its purposes. 
uh, but there is concerns that ultimately it will just start getting extended. Remember how in uh, 1995, when a KPDNA if you're going to be charged, be convicted, and within 10 years, we keep you in there whether you've actually committed a crime or not. Can you trust the government and what they say? There we go. Okay, any questions about current research? Uh, of course, programs like CSI are sort of accelerating the process of, of solving the crime. Yeah. What's the reality of, of doing that in the real world? Um, it's very unusual to do it within an hour, including three commercial breaks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with volume crime, like uh, urban auto crime, DNA and fingerprints would typically be searched within something like seven days. And that's simply because you join the queue and eventually it works way to the front of the queue. If you had more people and more money, you could do it quicker. But seven days is reckoned to be a reasonable time to actually get those results back in. If you leave it too long, the police officers lose interest in that particular crime because they want to know about what happened yesterday, not what happened three months ago. If you had a major inquiry, the fingerprint could be searched in minutes. Once you've loaded it onto the national database, it will probably take an expert maybe half an hour code up all the features from the mark from the murder and load it on the National Fingerprint Computer. The search can then cover England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland in minutes if you give it a top priority. And then to make the identification, because we need to do the three separates before we tell the police don't arrest the wrong guy, add on maybe a couple of hours. <coughs> so it can be very short. DNA, if you throw enough money at it, you can get the DNA from the crime scene profiled, loaded, searched, named back to the police within 24 hours. Uh, so it can be reasonably quick, uh, but certainly nothing like the instantaneous that you might see on the tab. You don't load something and press a button and that pops in. Because <coughs> all of these, remember, require manual intervention. You have to check things manually before you tell the police to prevent one for arrests. <coughs> um, mark up the fingerprint, the, the expert manually marks the characteristics and you launch the search and off it goes uh, to the national computer which service stored at uh, Pendon, uh, so the uh, control of the net, so they look after the security of it. Um, and then you get on the next one. And if it's not a priority, in half an hour now, that will pop that result. You look to see if you've got any respondents. Um, on the screen, you can have a quick look and say, oh, definitely not him. And oh, it could be him. I'll now get the fingerprint form out and do the check manually. But there's no dramatics. There's nothing actually whizzing in front of the screen. You, you don't want that. So it's very, uh, when people go and have a look at the fingerprint bureau, they see how boring it is. But there's no, nothing really fancy to see happening. Can I just ask you, one of the other things that I, I wonder whether it is realistic is whether the scenes of crime officers do their own lab work. Is no, that, that's no. the, Certainly yeah. in this country, um, there's very clear division of responsibility. The scenes of crime officer goes to the crime scene, looks for, finds and recovers. They are not expert witnesses, they are not able to give opinion in court. In court, they can simply say, this is what I did. And I did it this way, because that's how I was trained to do it, and the little instruction booklet tells them that's what I do. As long as I stick to the booklet, I'm safe. It's when they veer away from the booklet that they start getting into trouble. Uh, for example, so you've put the wrong date down on the exhibit label. What else did you do right then? And immediately, the jury starts to think, well, they're not very good, they didn't know what day of the week it was. But the fingerprint expert uh, will stand in the box and say, in my opinion, that's his fingerprint. And that's what convicts. Um, what the defence like is not the fingerprint expert, because the alien argue with that is pointless getting somebody in to say that ain't his fingerprints. What they like to argue with is the sins crime officer who might have spelt the name wrong, who might have missed um, the time they covered a particular exhibit at. Something that's easy to do, but the defence would then argue where they're incompetent. They weren't trusted to do that, so how can you expect them to be competent about recovering the evidence? 
So that's why being a sin crime officer is extremely meticulous and methodical work. Um, it's very repetitive, but you've got to treat everything um, absolutely precisely. There is no room for being sloppy over it because you will not last in the witness box if you are. I suppose ultimately you might be able to, from the point of view of it being a police database, you've got to say, well, what's the value to the police? So if you can, if the, if you can say to the police, actually, he's got the most enormous nose you've ever seen, that's useful. If you say to the police, well, actually, in 20 years' time, you might get Alzheimer's, you're probably not that bothered. So the police go down that, or let's have one great big database, let's take it away from Appo, and we can start loading them the data, well, then it starts to get dangerous. Because who trusts the government? <laughs> or, or News International. Um, are there any other questions about current research activities that people want to ask us doing? Um, we've done a reasonable amount, both on different alloys and elements, uh, and as you might expect, really reactive metals like zinc and aluminium naturally have um, a passivating layer on them just through uh, oxidation in the air, so the fingerprint sweat can't really get down to the metal. Right. And then you go to the other extreme, you have metals like platinum and gold, so unreactive, the sweat doesn't really react with them. But then you get a core of elements and alloys in the middle, things like copper and brass and bronze, that do corrode very readily. So and it's successful over still quite a significant range of yeah. materials. Then. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, brass, because it's cheap and it's easy to machine, is used to make a lot of components like shell casings. Um, uh, and so it has application there. Thanks. What you do find is, is that uh, people who like to have a fancy shell casing, you can buy them that are nickel plated. Um, they don't perform any better, they look nicer, I guess, when you're out shooting and you've got them with you. And uh, the nickel plated don't, don't corrode. Um, but they're very much in the minority. I, I think for cheapness uh, and ease of machinability, Brass is a, is a popular choice. Um, in this country, fortunately, we don't have a lot of gun crime, but uh, in the United States, where they're like awash with guns, um, they tend to like get a brand new box of shell casings. They just pick it straight out of the box. You've got nice, shiny brass metal. It hasn't tarnished in air. It corrodes readily, straight in the gun, fire it off, and you get opportunity for it to corrode. Which is why I think this technique is found more um, success and popularity in the United States than it has in the UK, because we just don't have that problem. Uh, caution tell, going back to my interview, I knew nothing about police or forensic science, so I thought, I know what I'll do. Uh, so just before the interview, I got out of our local library a copy of the Northamptonshire Police Annual Report. And I read up on it so I knew what the police areas were like, who was in charge, what the population of the country was, and there was a little bit about forensics, so I read all about that. So when it came to the interview, when they asked me things, I was like, oh, have you ever thought about doing this? Oh, yeah, we, we were just thinking about doing it. That's, and after I got the job, one of the interviewers said, you nearly blew it because you knew too much. And we thought somebody had briefed you beforehand. So of course you can over prepare for your interview by turning up like a smart addict. You know, <laughs> <laughs>